the session that's going to happen now is devoted to iconography and it gives me the greatest of pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Um, we have two colleagues speaking in this particular session. We have uh, Dr. Mithne Mihail, who is from the National University of Arts in the New York, New York College in Bucharest. And his paper is entitled Mary, Christ's Body and the True Cross, the Virgin's role as co-redemptrix in the case of 14th century wall paintings in the Kingdom of Hungary, followed by, uh, excuse me, I'm just uh, scrolling down, uh, Stephen Hughes. Uh, Stephen, uh, his paper is called Medievalism, Iconography and Theology in 19th Century Stained Glass Annunciations. Uh, we'll take them in order and just to complete the introductions, um, uh, our first speaker is a teaching assistant at the National University of Arts and Research at the New York College in Bucharest. Um, he has defended his thesis in 2018 and his principal fields of interest are medieval wall paintings, iconography and the relationship between images and sacred spaces. Um, he's already publishing articles and we look forward to what um, uh, this paper entails. And uh, our second speaker, Stephen Hughes. Stephen is currently a PhD candidate at Trinity College Dublin, funded by the Provost's Award. And he's researching representations of the Virgin Mary in the stained glass of Dublin. And Stephen takes us much further forward in time, um, considering uh, the reception of Marian images in the 19th century. So as with the previous sessions, we'll have both speakers and then we'll have questions at the end. So if I could invite Michal to kick us off and give his paper, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. Uh, I will now share my forward presentation and um, please let me know if it works fine. We can see your presentation, yes. Okay, and is it also full screen? Yes. Work? Okay, thank you. So uh, my paper will be less about music and uh, more about iconography. Uh, my presentation will concentrate on a wall painting from the parish church in Kraskovo, present day Slovakia, former Hungarian kingdom, that is dated to the end of the 14th century. The image that I am interested in is a mural diptych found on the northern nave wall and is formed by representations of the Pieta with Saints John the Evangelist and Mary Magdalene, as well as an image of Diana Zeltrit coupled with a figure of St. Helen with a true cross. The murals were intended to be perceived together, as is demonstrated by the pictorial border, which differs from all the other paintings of the Northern Naval, as can be seen, for example, in the border of the legend of St. Ladislas that you have here in the upper register, which is similar to the one of the Annunciation on the Triumphal Arch, or as we can also see on the Triumphal Arch, in the case of Mary with a mantle and Michael is aware of souls, where the frames are following a similar pattern, although the actual ornamentation is slightly different. In the case of the diptych that I'm talking about, one can clearly see the pictorial border for the lower register, which also encompasses the adoration of the Magi on the western half of the northern wall here. But the images of the Pieta, St. Helen and Diana Seldrit receive a further frame, which marks them as a self-standing composition, as a devotional image that has an almost object-like quality and that interrupts the narrative of the episode from ch Christ's childhood. My interpretation will be based primarily on the use of these motives in other wall paintings from the former Hungarian kingdom. As I will argue, the joining of these two compositions can be interpreted in light of late medieval patterns of Marian devotion. The paintings present the medieval viewer with images that emphasize Mary's agency as a purveyor of Christ's sacrificial body and accentuated his real presence in the Eucharist. In order to demonstrate this, my paper has two sections. In the first one, I will address the joining of St. Anne's figure with that of St. Helen, while in the second part, I will analyze the image of the Pieta. When it comes to the Hungarian kingdom, the cult of St. Anne reaches the realm of St. Stephen in the 13th century, mainly through the propaganda of Franciscans and Augustinians arriving in the kingdom from the German lands. This led to the hypothesis that images of St. Anne 
should be linked with the debates regarding the Immaculate Conception, an interpretation that pertains not only to the frescoes in medieval Hungary, but to a greater part of the corpus of Anna Seldred images as a whole. Nonetheless, in the absence of documents that can prove the implication of mendicants in the conception of pictorial programs, one shouldn't automatically link the visual presence of St. Anne with the friar's theological and devotional concerns. What I want to concentrate upon is the joining of Anna Seldred imagery or representations of the holy kinship with the scene of the discovery of the true cross or with the single figure of St. Helen. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, one of the first instances of this pattern can be witnessed at the church in Tornash and Dandras, a village in present day Hungary that belonged to the powerful Bebek family. The coherence of the pictorial program is difficult to evaluate, since many of the scenes were lost and the wall paintings flanking the image of Anne with the Virgin and Christ had been severely damaged. In this case, I would like to point to the proximity between the Anna Seldred and the theme of Saints Constantine and Helen discovering the true cross that was placed in the lower register of the southern half of the Triumphal Arch. However, the Triumphal Arch presents an even more convincing juxtaposition by the placement of Christ's maternal descendants in the register above the finding of the cross. The image of the kinship, represented as always in the Kingdom of Hungary with exclusively female characters, is superimposed on the narrative episode which depicts Constantine and Helen during the discovery of the place where the cross was buried, thanks to the help of Judas Syriacus. In this case, the historical character is amplified through visual narration and marks a contrast with the hieratic posture of the Holy Kinship, thus enhancing the foundational moment of the crucifixion as a basis for his bodily sacrifice during the liturgy. A similar occurrence seems to have been present in the now lost wall paintings from Czornotisi. Fortunately, the 19th century watercolor by Kalman Kalosh permits the analysis of the fresco along the same lines. Without trying to establish a direct link between different churches who are not necessarily related to patronage or workshops, one can observe that the composition in Czornotisi presents the same coupling that can be observed in Kraskovo and Tornas and Tandras. If in the first one, Helen was represented as a self-standing saint, and in the second, the scene was expanded through a narrative composition. In Czornotisiv, the empress is alone, but the cross is flanked by two characters that point to the historical moment of its discovery. In addition to that, if one could vouch for the accuracy of Kalish's watercolor, St. Helen seems to have been pictured, gesturing towards the holy kinship, and thus establishing for the viewer an integrated reception of the two motives. For the moment, allow me to return for a while at the image of the Pietà. Most of the literature that concentrates on this iconographic motif is concerned with the example of sculptures, their three-dimensionality being decisive in formulating hypotheses pertaining to the impact of devotional objects on their viewers. To the imposing special presence of the Pietas, art historians add the tactile quality of images, which, as Jacqueline Jung argues, is crucial in understanding the place of sculpture in medieval religious imagination. Jung states that sculptures, not only pietas, but them as well, are the main source for visionary experiences, for effective responses, and for devotional acts focused on cultic objects. The composition itself presents the viewer with an act of touching, of union with the embodied divinity. The Virgin's hands, supporting Christ, praying or presenting his body, suggests through the image that the devotional practice of touching sculpture is an act of piety. However, studies like that of Jung, Joanna Ziegler, or Jeffrey Hamburger, which posit a gendered approach to the effective agency of Pieta images, should be understood in their specific, mostly monastic contexts. However, I believe that in the case of parish churches, one must consider a shifting impact of representations in the context of a larger community. And thus following the lines of Claire Mary Snow and others in suggesting that the concept of imitatio Marie surpasses gender differences and the simple identification of compassion with a purely female response to images. When talking about mural representations of the Pietà, one must also take into account 
the loss of the the three-dimensional quality, which is essential in interpretation of its functions. This might also explain the disproportionate attention of researchers to Pieda sculptures at the expense of murals and miniatures. In the case of wall paintings depicting the Pieta, and at least for the Hungarian kingdom, their role was often, I believe, though not always, that of enhancing the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Before returning to the church in Kraskovo, I would like to briefly present three cases that I believe are relevant for the issue at stake. Contemporary to the painting in Kraskovo, the Pieta in Luborec shares a similar composition. The Virgin with Christ's body was placed at the center, flanked by two figures, John the Evangelist and St. Peter with the keys of the heavenly Jerusalem. The wall painting occupies the lower register of the southern half of the triumphal arch. Unfortunately, other murals of the arch are no longer extant, but the placement of this image inside the sacred space is relevant. As Anne Kathleen Eriksson and others argue, the presence of a pieta in the proximity of the altar responds to the Eucharistic rite and the bodily sacrifice emphasized in the iconography. One can point to the painting of the church in Suatu from the first half of the 15th century, where the Pieta is in close proximity with an image of the Eucharistic Man of Sorrows, the latter occupying the lower register of the northern half of the Triumphal Arch. The inclusion of the Pieta on or in the proximity of the arch activates the dynamics of the church interior, marking a threshold between the nave and the sanctuary as the space of the Eucharistic offering. At Luborec, the centrality of the cross and the positioning of the Pieta along its axis help identify Mary with the altar and the body of Christ with the liturgical sacrifice. In the case of Luborec, the presence of St. Peter, the skipper of the Keys of Heaven, points to a further relevance of Pieta iconography and its relation to the sacred space. His inclusion in the painting might reflect the importance of communion in attaining personal redemption and access to the heavenly Jerusalem. That the case in Luborec is not an isolated occurrence and that the image of the Pieta might follow the logic that I propose here can be witnessed in two other churches painted soon after 1400. Once again, my main interest lies with the murals of the Triumphal Arch. In the case of Ofeherto, the small image of the Pieta was placed on the northern half of the arch under a representation of St. Michael with the scales, which you can see here, and above the remaining figure of a female saint who might be identified with St. Helen at the bottom, although the state of preservation of the murals doesn't allow a precise description. At Poruba, painted slightly earlier, the Pieta appears once again coupled with the Archangel Michael, this time on the southern half of the eastern nave wall. You can see it on the right hand here. It is worth noticing that in the case of Poruba, the iconographic program couples the archangel with the motive of Mary with a mantle, a compositional pattern that can also be observed in Kraskovo. Uh, there is not a time here to present my arguments regarding the iconographic couple of the Protertic Virgin and Michael as a wearer of souls, but suffice it to say that I consider them to function as markers and makers of sacred space. This iconographic couple, formed by St. Michael and Mary, represents a visual formula that concurs with the medieval notion of Iderus, of the dynamic actuality that leads the believer and his soul towards the sacred space of the sanctuary, in order to create the sequentiality that could not have been physically possible due to the size of these monuments. In addition to that, the protecting virgin at Poriba is joined by two female saints, one of them being St. Helen with the cross, and you can see her here on the right. In an attempt to wrap up all the scattered observations, let me return to the starting point of my paper. My contention is that at Kraskovo, the paintings that form the mural diptych I am referring to function both as self-standing motives and in connection with each other as visual arguments that highlight the real presence of Christ in the Eucharistic offering. In the case of the Pietà, its Eucharistic overtone is emphasized through the presence of John the Evangelist and of the Magdalene. According to Jeffrey Humberger, the divinization of John in the late Middle Ages 
occurs as a result of two intersecting principles. Firstly, the parallel between Christ's sacrifice body and the virginal purity of John. Secondly, the similarity between the deification of the evangelist and the mystery of the transubstantiation. Thus, at the end of the Middle Ages, John becomes a symbol of prayers addressed to the Eucharist based on his status as a first-hand witness of the historical and first sacrifice. The figure of Mary Magdalene might be as well interpreted in connection with the importance of communion. Preached as an exemplary penitent, especially by the mendicants, Mary Magdalene embodies the necessity of penance as a preamble of receiving personal redemption through Christ's sacrificed body. For Giordanus of Quedlinburg, a 14th century Augustinian monk, the Magdalene's mirror vase, present in Pascovo painting as well, as you can see here, is a metaphor that signals the pathway to salvation for every Christian. At the same time, if John the Evangelist becomes the type of Alter Christus, the Magdalene can be understood as a complement to the Virgin's role in salvation. An Easter sermon by St. Augustine states that the role of Redemptrix assigned to Mary is shared with Magdalene, the first being a direct participant to Christ's embodiment, while the second was the first herald of his resurrection. The joining of John the Evangelist and Mary Magdalene can be also witnessed even in cases where the Pieta is missing, as with a 14th century altar that is currently preserved at the Ioanneum Museum in Graz. When turning to the right half of the diptych, the space is populated by the figures of St. Helen and Diana Seldrit, the image of Anne, Mary, and Christ. The Empress is part of the same virtual space as Christ's skin, and was therefore intended to be perceived jointly by the medieval viewer. As Barbara Bayet noted in her seminal book on the medieval heritage of the Holy Wood, the true cross becomes particularly venerated as a powerful relic in the Holy Roman Empire beginning with the 13th century, when crusaders, and especially the Teutonic Order, promote the image of St. Helen and the discovery of the cross. Bayard argues that the crusading propaganda is mirrored by a growing devotion of the Knights' Order towards the Virgin. A case has been made in previous literature for the use of the images depicting St. Helen or the discovery of the True Cross in the Hungarian Kingdom in relation to crusade ideology, although not exactly with the Teutonic Order and not in connection with the Church in Kraskovo. However, I believe that Christ's sacrifice stands at the core of this diptych. The symbolic relation between Helen and Mary has at its core Christ's embodiment, and the discovery of the true cross relates to the moment of disaccommodation in the flesh. If the Mother of God evinced the Savior's humanity, Helen offered the proof of his resurrection, the relic of the cross partaking in a continuous embodiment of Christ for the redemption of humanity. Thus, individual salvation can be obtained to Christ's sacrificial body reiterated in the context of the Eucharistic rite, but also through the Holy Cross, a guarantee of the resurrection of the body and soul at the universal judgment. The interpretation I propose, I believe to be confirmed by the general scheme of this mural diptych. The presence of the Pietà constructs a parallel with the neighboring image of the Anna Seltrit and St. Helen, which determines the viewer to consider them together. Even the compositional pattern seems to have been devised in order to relate the two spaces. The cross is depicted twofold and has roughly the same dimensions, while the seated position and inclination of the Virgin holding Christ's dead body is repeated through Anne's posture. As a result, the historical moments of sacrifice and death is doubled by an ongoing cyclical reenactment that presents the true cross and the body of Christ as means of redemption. Um, as a sort of working conclusion, my paper argued that in the case of the Hungarian kingdom, the joining of these two compositions can be interpreted in light of late medieval patterns of Marian devotion. The presence of the Pietà with its strong emphasis on Christ that body and the terrestrial trinity formed by St. Anne, the Virgin and Christ, point to the fact that Mary acts as a central figure in the historical moment of the crucifixion and in the reenacted Eucharistic rite. Her role as a corredentrix through her bestowment of Christ's humanity was of central importance in the late Middle Ages. While iconographic motives like the Pietà, the Anna Zeldrit, or the Holy Kinship 
are usually researched in light of their presence in sculptures or in miniatures and altar pieces. My aim was to argue that the visual networks established between these wall paintings presented the medieval viewer with images that emphasized Mary's agency as a purveyor of Christ's sacrificial body and accentuated his real presence in the Eucharist. Such an interpretation might be consolidated by the theologic and iconographic similarity already noted in previous literature between the Holy Trinity and the image of the Anaselfid. Already in the 11th century, the virgin and child motive was coupled with the Trinity in the famous Winchester Psalter. In an insightful article dedicated to the intimate bond between uh, the Holy Trinity and the Holy Family, Barbara Newman argued that the Winchester miniature offers the reader a familial setting to the joining of his maternal descendants that mediated this embodiment. Christ's double nature becomes familiar and an extraordinary 15th century sculpture created by Hans Mülcher depicts a standing Pieta-like image in which Mary's role was taken over by God the Father with the Holy Dove completing the Trinitarian iconography. What is intriguing about this otherwise common representation is the back of the sculpture, which preserves a prayer dedicated to St. Anne, Mary and Christ, thus informing a devotional continuity between the two. The parallel between the fleshly and the divine trinity suggests the change of focus through which the maternal genealogy no longer, and no longer has its counterpart, Christ's Davidic line, but rather God's paternity, asserting along the lines of Virginia Nixon's interpretation, an almost equal participation in the process of redemption. As a consequence, Christ's maternal and human ancestry is as important as his paternal divine descendants and is reminiscent of the familiar trope of Mary's role as a corredentress. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope that I wasn't reading too fast. Thank you, Minea, that was wonderful. And thank you for introducing us, uh, for those of us who aren't familiar with, to all those wonderful images. Um, so we'll now move to Stephen, and then we'll have questions for both speakers at the end. So Stephen, can I invite you to give your paper, please? Uh, yep, yeah, I'll just share my screen. So do let me know if you can't see this. Uh, so um, my paper is on uh, these stained glass windows from the 19th century. So in the 19th century, stained glass windows were made by the firm of Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Co. to designs by Edward Byrne Jones and William Morris, working in a tradition which stretched back to some of the earliest Christian artworks. They revived iconography and theological ideas which had not been current in England for centuries. However, it was not a straightforward copying of old forms, but a reinterpretation through their own understanding of the ideas. This paper will look at Annunciation windows made by them and analyze how they deploy their medieval theology and iconography in these artworks and how they vary and depart from it. There was a great revival of stained glass occurring in Britain at this time, instigated among others by Augustus Pugin, an architect and vociferous critic of architecture and promoted by groups such as the Cambridge Camden Society, later known as the Ecclesiological Society. Pugin and the Ecclesiological Society were highly influential proponents of Gothic architecture. The Society published a journal which advised any future builders on their interpretation of the correct way to build a church. It was a learned society with the stated aims to restore buildings to the glories of the past. They saw the Middle Ages as a time of perfect Christianity, an era where men were more spiritually minded and less worldly minded than in the 19th century. The concerns of Pugin and the ecclesiologists were largely relating to recreating correct medieval styles and forms in aesthetic terms. The Middle Ages also greatly appealed to William Morris and Edward Burne Jones, two highly creative figures. They too were learned in many aspects of the Middle Ages and deeply interested in theology and the religious debates of their day although with them it manifested itself in a different way. Morris and Burne Jones met in 1852 at the University of Oxford, where both went to study, intending on taking holy orders. One of the reasons Burne Jones had initially been drawn to Oxford had been the Oxford Movement, a high church movement named for its associations with the city. 
The Oxford movement was primarily concerned in its campaigning and literature with aspects of liturgy and theology. Morris and Burne Jones had had an interest in the medieval world from their youth, but it was while at Oxford that their interest became a studied, concerted effort. While on a trip to northern France in 1855 to visit medieval Gothic cathedrals there, both Morris and Burne Jones abandoned their plans of careers in the church. They decided between them that instead, Burne Jones would become a painter and Morris an architect. Although Morris did not become an architect, this new path did lead to them setting up in 1861 a company to provide works in the decorative arts, Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Co, hereafter referred to as The Firm. Morris and Burne Jones were both partners, along with prominent artists Dante Gabriel Rossetti and others. All partners had different levels of involvement, with Morris running most of the firm's operations and Morris, Burne Jones and Rossetti contributing most of the designs for the firm's early output. They worked in a variety of media, creating original designs for any who would commission them and selling work made reusing designs already made for other purposes. They catered both for church furnishings and for the private market, and for clients from the middle class to the extremely wealthy. Rossetti was a key influence on both Morris and Burne Jones, and an early art teacher for both. He was also a member of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, a group of artists who rejected the academy-taught approach to art and emphasised study from nature. Rossetti fell afoul from anti-Catholic critics with his painting Ecce Ancilla Domini, which he later changed the title to the Annunciation and altered the mottos from Latin to English due to accusations of popery and mariolatry. The use of Latin may have been seen to be evoking Roman Catholicism when there was a strong strain of anti-Catholic sentiment aimed at medieval art and that which evoked it at this time. This anti-Catholic sentiment was at a high in the 1850s following the re-establishment of the Catholic hierarchy in England. It has been said by many scholars of the pre-Raphaelites and Morris and Burne Jones that they did not replicate medieval styles or forms, but attempted to recreate the spirit of the medieval in their work. Morris said, if we do not study the ancient work directly and learn to understand it, we shall find ourselves influenced by the feeble work all round us, and we shall be copying the better work through the copyists and without understanding it, which will by no means bring about intelligent art. Let us therefore study it wisely, be taught by it, kindled by it, all the while determining not to imitate or repeat it, to have either no art at all or an art which we have made our own. In their approach to stained glass, they practiced exactly this, rejecting the copying favored by many of their rivals in stained glass and instead taking a studied understanding of medieval art, which they made their own. They did follow the example of the Gothic revival movement and replicated the medieval technique, in making stained glass, using lead lines to outline the subjects and coloured pieces of glass arranged in mosaic style to create the picture, ignoring the prevailing style of the previous centuries when the addition of enamel paints to clear glass was the primary method of creating pictures in glass. But their overall aesthetic stays much closer to pre-Raphaelite art. So how then is this medieval spirit captured in the stained glass designed by Burne Jones and Morris, if not in the style? It is in their use of iconography and theology, which underpins it, which they include in their ecclesiastical works. The holy order intentions of Morris and Burne Jones, their interest in the Oxford movement, their pre-Raphaelite influence and direct pupillage to Rossetti, and their studious attitude to the medieval, combine to give us a unique approach to religious art and medievalism, which is present in their work. The windows which will be discussed here were made between 1863 and 1872, in the midst of a period of great church building and restoration activity. It is during this time that Burne Jones and Morris have their greatest interaction with and motivations for these theologically influenced works of medievalism, as after this point, Morris distanced himself further from the firm's work in stained glass and slid slowly towards agnosticism or even atheism. The first window to be looked at is found in a small church in Bolton in North Yorkshire. The exterior of the church is small and simple, but the interior is highly intricate with structural brick bounded polychromy characteristic of its architect, a leading proponent of the Gothic revival, William Butterfield. Dalton was built for a fairly low price of £2,000 and from the simplicity of the exterior and splendour of the interior, it is clear that Butterfield spent most of the money and his attention on the interior decoration. All the windows on the inside were made by the firm. 
and this is unusual for a church built by Butterfield. Butterfield's controlling nature may not have mixed well with working with the firm, whose designers, in particular Morris, had a reputation for not being easy to dictate terms to, as other Gothic revival architects had found. Task commissioned by Butterfield at this time has a characteristic quality to it, which is unlike work by the same glass designers for other architects. This can be seen both in windows at churches before and after Butterfield's involvement and in the work of designers for Butterfield and for others. Butterfield was a very demanding man who knew exactly what he wanted and viewed the position of the glass painter as subordinate to that of the architect. For example, these enunciations demonstrate the more typical style of window Butterfield favoured at this time. Both windows feature gothic canopies above the figures and characteristic colouring favouring very bright red gold and cool blue. Even the faces of the figures are similar, simply painted in with spare black lines. However, the Annunciation at Dalton is very unlike the typical Annunciation of a Butterfield church, instead looking very typical of the work of the firm. It is in two lights, with Gabriel and Mary facing each other in profile, occupying one light each. The division of the scene across the mullion is a common feature of Annunciations, occurring, for example, at York Minster in the Great West Window of the mid-14th century. The mullion divides the two figures and the two spaces they occupy, the celestial and the earthly. This sort of mark of division between Mary and Gabriel is common in medieval art. Many medieval depictions of the Annunciation make use of varying the levels at which the figures are placed at in order to convey a theological message of some kind. As at York, Gabriel can be depicted kneeling or genuflecting towards Mary, which can be a sign of her high status with God, or even her royalty, as some depictions include her enthroned. Alternatively, Mary is shown kneeling in prayer at a prayer desk or prie dieu, which emphasises her piety and humbleness. But at Dalton, the two figures are of the same height, at perfect eye level. The distinguishing feature between them is that while Mary has a nimbus in two circlets, an inner of white and an outer of red, Gabriel has no nimbus. Is this to emphasise Mary's holiness, even raising it above Gabriel's? That is certainly a rare and unusually strong approach you've taken for this time, if so. Most depictions in the 19th century either give both figures a nimbus or neither, so this unequal presentation works contrary to their equal spatial level. And the reason for this is perhaps due to Morris copying directly from medieval sources elsewhere and maintaining this feature here. One of the first stained glass commissions of the firm was for the Church of All Saints in Selsley. This included, this included an annunciation designed by Morris, which in key areas follows very closely the 15th century work by the Meister des Marienliebens, as noted by Adrian Barlow in his lecture for the Church's Conservation Trust. The overall composition of Mary and the Gabriel is, is, same, is the same between the two, with Gabriel's pose and costume a near exact match. Both the Morris window at Selsley and the German painting give Mary a halo and Gabriel none, something which has been carried over at Dalton. But it is important to note that although the composition and certain iconographic elements are lifted verbatim from the Germanic picture, the style itself is entirely modern. However, while Selsley follows its model in further highlighting Mary's importance with a genuflecting Gabriel, Dalton does not, keeping Mary and Gabriel otherwise equal. Is giving her alone a nimbus then a mistake, or an attempt to convey her holiness without going so far as to kneel before her? Returning to Dalton, Mary's clothes are similar in colour and pattern to Gabriel's here, mostly of a white that alludes to her purity and virginity. Mary holds a book in her right hand with her left clutched to her breast. The book that Mary holds is closed, and a closed book is often taken as a symbol of Mary's virginity, as both Mary and the book are sealed. This is also a highly floral depiction. The figures are placed on a background of a garden with roses growing up trellises, a tree behind each figure's back extending above their heads. Some blue flowers grow along the bottom of the garden and a pot with a lily extending from it is placed at Mary's feet, between her and Gabriel. Pomegranates also grow from the trees above them. Many of these are traditional iconographic elements typical of Annunciation and also of other medieval artworks. The diamond quarries which surround the figures are also repeating patterns of two different floral representations lifted directly from late medieval windows at King's College, Cambridge. The garden setting contributes to a reading of the setting as a hortus conclusus, the closed garden mentioned in Canticles. 
This is often significantly placed in the background of annunciations, as for example in early 15th century works by Fra Angelico. Fra Angelico was a favourite of Busfield and other Gothic revivalists, as well as of Morris and Burne Jones. As with the closed book, the Hortus Conclusus is a symbol of the unpenetrated room and another sign of Mary's virginity. The design for the window at Dalton was reused on many occasions, and three of the usages have text underneath the figures labelling them, including the original use of this design for stained glass at Lord Leicester Hospital. All other uses of this design label Mary as Anquilla Domini instead of S. Maria Virgo as at Dalton. By identifying the figure as the Virgin in the Dalton window, the manifold ways in which her virginity have been highlighted and symbolised in the window are shown. Virginity is the primary emphasis here. And perhaps a further reason for this identification is that the Meister des Marienliebens Annunciation features the text Santa Maria Virgo running through Mary's halo. Perhaps Morris is showing the impression that that work made on him again here and its reverence and his reverence for this particular commission. In the Dalton window, a strong use of medievalism is seen in the incorporation of medieval quarries and the deployment of medieval iconography and symbolism. The lily, hortus conclusus and book are all potent symbols of Marian virginity and Mary is identified in the window as the Virgin instead of one of numerous other possible formulations as accompanied this design in its other uses. The learned approach to the iconography and knowledge of art history in this window shows a strong engagement with scholarship and tradition in this area, making these very deliberate conscious decisions and things which would not be readily understood in the 19th century. The next example I'm going to look at is found at Castle Howard, a stately home built beginning in the early 18th century in a mixed Baroque and Palladian style. There is no outward sign that there is a chapel within as the area blends seamlessly into the rest of the house. Beginning in 1870, the chapel was rebuilt and redecorated. The previous chapel was less than a century old at this point in one of the newest parts of Castle Howard. That it was decided to rebuild it shows how much tastes had changed during the intervening period and how the earlier dead white and more typically classical chapel was no longer seen as suitable for tastes of the day. On the opening of the new chapel, a local newspaper said of the old chapel that it had no ecclesiastical character. The choices made in the rebuilding of this chapel are very unusual, creating almost a fusion of Gothic and classical styles. There are columns at the east and west ends more fitting for a Roman temple, and pediments above the windows in a multi-tiered reredos with red marble columns and pediments atop each tier. However, this is also rather dark, highly colourful and with warm paintings throughout, features more characteristic of the Gothic revival than anything neoclassical. The stained glass windows in the chapel follow this blend of styles, combining architectural elements which echo those in the chapel with the typical figures of a Burne Jones design. The enormous amount of money involved in the chapel rebuild is also worth noting, as nearly four times as much was spent here as at Dalton. This is a prestige project with a high status patron in a high status setting, full of conscious decisions with ample evidence of discussion between patron and artists. This is a complete glazing scheme as at Dalton, but on this occasion, all the windows are newly commissioned designs and all by Burne Jones. As such, you'll be expected that the harmony of the scheme should be even greater than it was at Dalton, and it is certain that the cost should be expected to higher. In the end, nearly 10% of the total cost of the chapel rebuild was for the windows. In the Annunciation window, there is a tree in the centre dividing the two figures, as with the mullion and lily at Dalton. A snake is coiled around the trunk of the tree, which has a human head lying in anguish on the ground at the base of the tree. The whole, thing, the whole scene takes place in a grassy, verdant land with a blue-green backdrop, which looks like a tapestry or wall hanging, but with floral patterning. Because of how few elements there are within the scene, and how unusual it is, the snake with the woman's head takes centre stage. This is, as far as I'm aware, entirely unique in all art and its inclusion in Annunciation. The snake with the human head is reasonably common in representations of Adam and Eve in the fall, with precedent from at least the 13th century at Amiens Cathedral, where it appeared in a sculpture on the South Portal, a cathedral that Morris and Burne Jones visited and greatly admired in their youth, and one of those seen during the trip which occasioned their turning from ministry to art. The earliest surviving reference to the woman-headed snake comes from Peter Comester, writing in the 11th century, who wrote, Satan chose a certain kind of serpent that has a young girl's face, 
because like heeds like. The inclusion of the snake with Mary does have some history. For example, another sculpture at Amiens on the south portal depicts the Virgin and Child with Mary treading on a snake, which also has a human head. Later, the snake would appear much more frequently with Mary in representations of the Immaculate Conception. But the combination of this snake with a human head into other scenes of the Virgin, particularly more earthly scenes, such as the Annunciation, has no parallel that I'm aware of. By linking the Serpent of Eden, especially the woman-headed version, the typological aspects of Mary already explored in the previous windows looked at are now brought to their fullest possible expression. The typological linking of Mary and Eve was very popular in the Middle Ages, as in Fra Angelico's Annunciation discussed earlier, where the figures of Adam and Eve are being escorted out of Eden at the side of the picture. But how this connection is made at Castle Howard is highly unusual. The inclusion of the serpent in Marian scenes connects Mary specifically with Genesis 3.15, which says, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. In the Castle Howard Annunciation, at the very moment of the incarnation, when Gabriel announces to Mary that she shall bear a son, this prophecy is fulfilled. The snake is crushed and lies at Mary's feet. As explained by Bernard of Clairvaux, Eve caused the world to fall after she listened to a serpent whispering words into her ear. So Mary brings about the redemption of the world by the message from God delivered by Gabriel and a dove representing the Holy Ghost, which appears to enter her ear. This interpretation is also one of the explanations of how Mary conceived and maintained her virginity. It is conceptio per aurem. The Holy Ghost has impregnated her through the ear. Burne Jones brings in a very unusual medieval idea of the serpent with a human head in order to emphasize Mary's status as the new Eve. This theological notion of typology is one which has been present in Christian thought from its very beginning, but during the Middle Ages took flight in numerous creative ways, and the Annunciation window at Castle Howard is working in this long tradition. The other case studies looked at have also alluded to typology in a similar way through their verdant settings, but neither of them are as original and daring as here. Burne Jones's experimental iconography had been criticised, particularly in his first stained glass annunciation made for Topcliffe. But by the time he came to design the annunciation for Castle Howard, he was much more assured of his ability to innovate and was able to work within a medieval tradition of iconography while also creating something wholly new and remarkable. The paper has shown how William Morris and Edward Burne Jones exhibit in their designs for ecclesiastical stained glass a particular medievalism channeled primarily through their focus on the iconography and theology of their subjects. They take a critical approach to the history of representing the subject by engaging with various sources and selecting elements appropriate to the emphasis they and their patrons wish to convey and the architectural context into which their window will fit. The firm was one of many newly founded producers of decorative arts for ecclesiastical patrons in the 19th century. But whereas most aim to imitate a medieval aesthetic as accurately as possible, Morris and Burne Jones come to their designs differently. This paper has argued that it is the iconography and the theology deployed in stained glass made by the firm, which bears out their medieval influences. And it was the more intangible spirit of the medieval which attracted Morris and Burne Jones and motivated them in much of their work. Medieval art and religion fascinated Morris and Burne Jones much as they continue to fascinate us today. By looking at how they approach their love of the medieval, a better appreciation can be gained for both the medieval art which inspired them and their own creations which fill British churches. By reinterpreting the medieval with a unique aesthetic and a mind that was engaged and aware of the history of their theme and the medium they were working in, they have created a body of work which hopefully will last just as long as the art which inspired them and gave them and us so much pleasure. Thank you.